Good morning. The session will commence in five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, if we could please ask you to say, take your seats so that we can uh, allow others into the room, we'd really appreciate it. If you could please take your seats. Thank you.
developing AI safely. This is extremely important. There is a greater danger if we allow it to become self-deciding. It will free people to work at a higher and more creative level. The worst case scenario is that they are smarter than us. Good morning, everybody. It is my privilege to welcome all of you to the first ever Global Summit on Frontier AI Safety. During a time of global conflict eight decades ago, these grounds here in Bletchley Park were the backdrop of a gathering of the United Kingdom's best scientific minds who mobilized technological advances in service of their country and their values. Today, We've invited you here to address a socio-technical challenge that transcends national boundaries and which compels us to work together in service of shared security and also shared prosperity. Our task is as simple as it is profound, to develop artificial intelligence as a force for good. The release of ChatGPT not even a year ago was a Sputnik moment in humanity's history. We were surprised by this progress, and we now see accelerating investment into an adoption of AI systems at the frontier, making them increasingly powerful and consequential to our lives. These systems could free people everywhere from tedious work and amplify our creative abilities they could help our scientists unlock bold new discoveries, opening the door to a world potentially without diseases like cancer and with access to near limitless clean energy. But they could also further concentrate unaccountable power into the hands of a few or be maliciously used to undermine societal trust, erode public safety or threaten international security. However, there is a significant uh, debate that is very robust, and I'm sure it's going to be very robust with the attendees in the, the next two days, just about whether these risks will materialize, how they will materialize, and potentially when they will materialize. Regardless, I believe that we in this room have a responsibility to ensure that they never do. Together, we have the resources and the mandate to uphold humanity's safety and security by creating the right guardrails and governance for the safe development and deployment of frontier AI systems. But this can't be left to chance or neglect or to private actors alone. And if we get this right, the coming years could be what the computing pioneer JCR Licklider foresaw as intellectually the most creative and exciting in the history of humankind. This is what we are here to discuss honestly and candidly together at this summit. Sputnik set off a global era of advances in science and engineering that spawned new technologies, institutions and visions and led humanity to the moon. We, the architects of this AI era, policymakers, civil society, scientists and innovators, must be proactive, not reactive, in steering the technology towards the collective good. We must always remember that AI is not some natural phenomenon that's happening to us, but it is a product of human creation that we have the power to shape and direct. And today, we will help define the trajectory of this technology to ensure public safety and that humanity flourishes in the years to come. We will work through four themes of risk in our morning sessions, which will include demonstrations by researchers from the UK's Frontier AI Task Force. Risk to global safety and security, risk from unpredictable advances, from loss of control, and from the integration of this technology within our societies. Now, some of these risks do already manifest as harms to people today and are exacerbated by advances of the frontier. 
The existence of other risks is more contentious and polarizing, but in the words of mathematician I.J. Good, a codebreaker colleague of Turing himself here at Bletchley Park, it is sometimes worthwhile to take science fiction seriously. Today is an opportunity to move the discussion forward from the speculative and the philosophical further towards the scientific and the empirical. Delegations and leaders from countries in attendance have already done so much work in advance of arriving. Across a diverse geopolitical and geographical spectrum to agree the world's first ever international statement on frontier AI, the Bletchley Declaration on AI Safety. Published this morning, the declaration is a landmark achievement and lays the foundations for today's discussions. It commits us to deepening our understanding of the emerging risks of frontier AI. It affirms the need to address these risks as the only way to safely unlock these extraordinary opportunities. And it emphasizes the critical importance of nation states, developers, and civil society in working together on our shared mission to deliver AI safety. But we must not remain comfortable with this overturn window. We each have a role to play in pushing the boundaries of what is actually possible. And that is what this afternoon will be all about, to discuss what actions different communities need to take next and to bring our diverse views and open up fresh ideas and challenge them. For developers to discuss a risking, uh, emerging risk management processes for AI safety, such as responsible, risk-informed capability scaling. For national and international policymakers to discuss pathways to regulation that preserve innovation and protect global stability. For scientists and researchers to discuss the socio-technical nature of society and approaches to better evaluate the risks. These discussions will set the tone of the chair's summary, which will be published tomorrow. They will guide our collective actions in the coming year. And this will lead up to the next summit that I am delighted to share with you today it will be hosted by the Republic of Korea in six months' time, and then by France in one year's time. These outputs and this forward process must be held to a high standard. Commensurate with the scale of the challenge at hand. And we have successfully addressed societal scale risks in the past. In fact, within just two years of the discovery of the hole in the Antarctic ozone layer, governments were able to work together to ratify the Montreal Protocol and then change the behavior of private actors to effectively tackle an existential problem. And we all now look back upon that with admiration and respect. But for the challenges posed by Frontier AI, how will future generations judge our actions here today? Will we have done enough to protect them? Will we have done enough to develop our understanding to mitigate the risks? Will we have done enough to ensure their access to the huge upsides of this technology? This is no time to bury our heads in the sand. And I believe that we don't just have a responsibility, we also have a duty to act and act now. So your presence here today shows that these are challenges we are all ready to meet head on. The fruits of this summit must be clear-eyed, understanding routes to collaboration and bold actions to realize AI's benefits whilst mitigating their risks. So I'll end my remarks by taking us back to the beginning. 73 years ago, Alan Turing dared to ask if computers could one day think. From his vantage point at the dawn of the field, he observed that we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. Today, we can indeed see a little bit further, and there is a great deal that needs to be done. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's get to work. Thank you. I'm now going to introduce our speakers for this session. First up, we have the US Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, 
It is wonderful that the US is the home to so many of the world's leading AI companies and that they have been so supportive of this summit. Gina and I are closely aligned in promoting innovation whilst thinking seriously about how we do manage those risks. And the US has shown leadership on AI safety from July's White Horse voluntary commitments through to this week's executive order. Our second speaker is Vice Minister Wu Zhaohui of the People's Republic of China. And I'm especially pleased that the Vice Minister can be with us today, given China's strong frontier AI capabilities, as well as its international efforts, such as the announcement just a week ago of its Global AI Governance Initiative. Our third speaker is Vice President of the European Commission, Vera Jourova. She has been driving forward the AI safety agenda in Europe and the world, most notably through her engagement with the EU AI Act. I also want to publicly recognize the Commissioner for her addressing of societal risks such as disinformation that could be exacerbated by the malicious use of frontier AI. Our fourth speaker is the chair of the UK's AI Frontier Task Force, Ian Hogarth. Ian is an entrepreneur and has been an investor for many years in dozens of tech and AI companies. His expert leadership and extensive experience of growing companies in the technological frontier, as well as his long-standing belief in the transformational power of safe AI, made him not only the perfect, but also the natural choice to lead our Frontier AI Task Force. This is the startup within government from which we will grow our new AI Safety Institute. And I have personally really enjoyed working hand in hand with Ian over the last few months. Thank you. Gina? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you. And thank you to Prime Minister Sunak for hosting such an incredibly important event. Uh, hats off to you. The crowd, it's an amazing crowd of people, and you did a fantastic job with your opening remarks. So uh, I want to thank you for your leadership and to my colleagues who've traveled from all over the world to be here. I think the fact that we are all here in person and have come from all corners of the world uh, gives me hope that we are all deeply committed to making sure that we move forward with AI innovation, but also do it in a safe way. Um, as uh, Secretary Domlin so beautifully said, Bletchley Park is a symbol of technology's potential to empower the heroic side of humanity, but it's also a reminder to all of us about how technology can indeed change the course of history. I will say, as many of you know, it is also a reminder that women who, as I understand, represented at one point three quarters of Bletchley Park code breakers were a vital yet underappreciated uh, asset in advancing science and harnessing its benefits. And I challenge all of us as we move forward with AI to have as many women and uh, a diverse group of people in the development and deployment of AI. Today, of course, we're here to address the unique dangers of the most advanced AI due to both misuse, but also, quite frankly, the risks that these systems might not operate the way they were intended to operate. The Biden administration's approach is to manage the risk so that we can harness the benefit. The president is challenging us in the United States and all of us here to make sure that we move forward as fast as we can with innovation, but to have a balanced approach and a critical eye on the risks, which is why we're all gathered today. I will say, I'm biased because he's my boss, but President Biden is showing unbelievable leadership in this regard. First, as Michelle said, by securing voluntary commitments um, by US AI companies who have committed to safe, secure, and trustworthy AI development, including red teaming of the AI models, mitigating harmful capabilities, and protecting the AI models from unauthorized release. That was step one, which we undertook early in the summer. Now on top of that, as you may have seen on Monday of this week, President Biden 
uh, uh, signed an executive order, which if you haven't reviewed it, I would encourage you to review it. It is a, a comprehensive executive order uh, building on the voluntary commitments that were made by America's leading AI companies. And as part of the executive order, the Commerce Department has been directed by the President to ask frontier AI developers to disclose to us red teaming, safety, and cybersecurity measures that they will be taking for next generation frontier models. We think that this combination of the voluntary commitments coupled with the reporting requirements is an important step towards the safe development of frontier AI and accountability. But of course, all of that uh, is built upon a foundation of standards. Built upon a foundation of standards and testing capability. And I absolutely welcome and applaud the UK's launch of its AI Safety Institute. And this morning, I'm very pleased to announce that the United States will be launching its own AI Safety Institute. That will be run by the Department of Commerce and housed in NIST within the Department of Commerce. Uh, many of you are familiar with NIST, world-leading work, a neutral third party to develop best-in-class standards. And NIST will be uh, developing the standards for safety, security, and testing. And we will be providing testing environments to evaluate known risks and emerging risks of uh, AI at the frontier. I'm also pleased to announce that the Institute is launching a consortia to work with partners in academia, industry, and nonprofits to advance its frontier AI safety mission. I will almost certainly be calling on many of you in the audience who are in academia and industry to be part of this consortia. We can't do it alone. The private sector must step up. We also have to commit to establishing a formal partnership between our Safety Institute and the United Kingdom Safety Institute. I want to say that loudly and clearly, and Michelle and I talked about this already. We have to get to work, and as between the U.S. and the U.K. and our Safety Institutes, we have to get to work together. Finally, I'll say the work, of course, does not begin and end with just the U.S. and the U.K. We want to expand information sharing, research collaboration, and ultimately policy alignment across the globe. And again, I want to thank all of my colleagues for being here. We will compete as nations. Competition is a good thing. It brings out the best in us and allows us to innovate. But even as we compete vigorously, we must search for global solutions to global problems. In the nuclear age, superpowers came together to cooperate and formulate global mechanisms of assurance. Today, in the age of AI, we have an even more complex problem that involves all of our nations and the private sector. It requires global coordination on AI safety. And it re requires us to do everything we can to make sure that this technology does not get into the wrong hands and is not misused. So I think I'll end with quoting Michelle. Will we have done enough? I want to be able to say yes. I know for myself as a leader and as a leader of the US AI Safety Institute, I want to be able to say yes, I've done enough to unleash innovation, but more important, make sure it is safe. And I hope that we can all say that at the end of our work together. Thank you. Thank you. 英国政府组织召开这次峰会
当前大家知道，以语言大模型、内脑智能、具身智能、分布式群体智能为代表的前沿人工智能这些技术快速迭代发展，实现了历史性的跨越，并且有望涌现出更多的重大的技术变革，其广泛的应用。将产生巨大的技术红利，给世界带来了巨大的机会。与此同时，人工智能技术在不确定性、不透明性以及不可解释性方面的特征，带来了伦理、安全、隐私、公平等方面的风险与挑战更加突出，复杂的效应不断的显现。中国政府高度重视人工智能的发展，将人工智能作为提升生产力水平和增进人民福祉的重要的赋能手段，发布了新一代人工智能发展规划，推动技术研发、建设开放平台、拓展应用场景、着力构建协同开放的创新体系。同时，我们也充分的认识到了。人工智能技术的两面性，发布治理规原则和伦理的规范，始终以高度负责任的态度来参加人工智能全球治理体系的建设和改革之中。二零二三年十月十八号，中国国家主席习近平先生在第三届“一带一路”国际合作高峰论坛开幕式的主体。演讲中提出了全球人工智能治理的倡议，倡议围绕着人工智能发展、安全和治理三个方面，全面系统地阐述了人工智能治理的中国方案。这是中方积极践行人类命运共同体、落实全球发展倡议、全球安全倡议、全球文明倡议的一个具体的行动。在当今世界和平与发展面临着多元的挑战的背景之下，我们认为通过对话和合作凝聚共识，构建起开放、公正、有效的治理机制。一是积极的倡导以人为本，智能向上，以增进人类共同福祉为目标，以保障社会安全、尊重。人权、人类权益为前提，确保朝着有利于人类文明进步的方向发展，遵守实用的国际法，符合和平发展、公平正义、民主自由的全人类的共同价值，共同来防范和打击对人工智能技术的滥用和恶用。二是加强。技术风险管控，支持以人工智能技术来防范人工智能的风险，提高人工智能治理的技术能力，推动建立人工智能风险等级测试的评估体系，确保人工智能始终处于人类可控制之下，打造起可审核、可监督、可追溯、可信赖的人工智能技术。三是鼓励各方协同共治，坚持相互尊重、平等互利的原则。各国无论大小、强弱，都有平等发展和利用人工智能的权利。要增强发展中国家在人工智能全球治理中的代表性和发言权，不断的弥合智能的鸿沟和智力能力的差距，鼓励全球。共享人工智能成果、知识成果，共开源人工智能的技术。各位部长、各位嘉宾、女士们、先生们，人工智能治理事关全人类的命运，是世界各国面临的共同的课题。只有国际社会共同努力，才能确保人工智能技术安全、可靠。中方愿同各方一道，就人工智能安全治理加强沟通交流，为推动形成普遍参与的国际治理机制
和具有广泛共识的治理框架，积极的贡献智慧和力量，促进人工智能技术更好的造福于人类，共同构建起人类命运共同体。我就讲这么多，谢谢大家。Madam Secretary of State, dear Michelle, dear colleagues, uh, of course I cannot start otherwise than to thank uh, the United Kingdom for organizing uh, of this uh, summit and for uh, inviting us. I speak on behalf of the European Union. I am sure my uh, boss, uh, Madam von der Leyen, tomorrow will convey her thanks to uh, Prime Minister Sunak as well, because this is really a great idea and also to organize this on this very place is, is very symbolic. Since uh, the EU published the first comprehensive strategy on AI in 2018, uh, you will agree with me that the technology has no doubt leaped forward immensely from what was a rather niche topic then uh, to a revolution that is literally at everyone's fingertips. But what has not changed is the fundamental tenet of our approach, the need to strike the right balance between reaping the immense benefits of AI whilst protesting, uh, protecting uh, what is most dear to us. So let me touch upon three areas, innovation, guardrails and governance. First, regarding innovation. Given the re remarkable growth in this technology, we need to ensure that the development of AI remains accessible to a wide and diverse field of actors, not just the few in the lead. One barrier of entry has been the vast amount of computing capacity now needed to be at the frontier. This is why the EU has decided to open up our high-performance computers some of the most capable on the planet to AI startups to train their models free of charge. And of course, I would uh, like also to speak about huge investments being done using uh, the EU budget, but also member states' budgets, but we don't have time for that. Second, uh, guardrails on AI. Uh, uh, I have seen much debate about whether uh, we should be focusing on the harms of AI that are known today or on more existential risks the technology can pose in the future. I find this a false debate. Both are necessary and both are possible. If we want to build trust in technology, we need to urgently address the risks we face now. The risk of discrimination, the risk to health and safety, the risk to our democracies and elections. Every bit of transparency, accountability, risk management and public oversight that we introduce now will also help us deal with more uncertain risks going forward. This is why we are setting out to do in the EU through the AI Act, an innovation-friendly, risk-based and future-proof approach to regulating AI. We expect agreement on this law before the end of the year. And on this law, we see how fast the development goes because we started, we adopted it at the Commission level in 2020. And now, together with the co-legislators, with the European Parliament and the Member States, we are drafting together the new chapter on generative AI, which is the uh, new uh, technology which uh, we want to uh, also cover by the regulation without hindering it and without limiting the benefits it can deliver. We have the State Secretary of Spain here who is, develop, who is uh, negotiating on behalf of the, of the member states. It's not easy work. Uh, I will quote you, Carmen. Uh, you said that how can we regulate something we don't know what it is. And uh, uh, our common agreement was last time at the trialogue, yes, we don't know what it is, but once we know what it is, it might be late. So that's why, that's why we are now developing the new chapter on generative AI. Might be that on the 6th of uh, December at St. Nicholas Day, we might have this done. <laughs> so uh, this is the EU at its best. I believe that we need uh, 
smart regulation combined with voluntary commitments. That's why also I'm <coughs> glad to announce that uh, uh, the G7 leaders announced this Monday uh, our agreement on guiding principles and a code of conduct for developers of advanced AI. We call on developers um, of AI present also here today and all others out there to endorse this code and commit to its application. We will be announcing the first list of signatories in the next weeks. This voluntary code is a useful complement to legislation and we see it working hand in glove with the provisions for foundational models which we are finalizing under the AI Act. To be able to manage fast changing AI technologies effectively, we need a solid knowledge base. The first step towards a more global governance for AI is access to internationally recognized independent scientific advice on the state of the technology. I will quote you, Michelle. How did you say it? Uh, speculative philosophical should stop for a while towards more scientific and technological, but then we have to take it back from the technologists and from the scientists to continue taking proper political decisions. I think it will be interaction. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for having a chance to, to speak here and to take part in this uh, important summit. Uh, I am sure I will be coming back enriched uh, by uh, new, uh, new information. And uh, last thing I want to say, again, uh, turning back what Michelle and Gina said, the history only will tell us whether we did the right thing in the right moment. We have our common obligation to do this right. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start by thanking the Secretary of State um, for embracing the enormous potential of this technology and also the Prime Minister for leading a global conversation around AI safety. So around the corner, Alan Turing used, and his team used the bomb machine to crack the Enigma code. And that machine evaluated 15 positions per second, and it weighed 900 kilograms. Today, the phone in my pocket performs two trillion times more operations per second. This advance in computing power has helped power the modern world. And it's a driving force behind the recent breakthroughs in AI. This plot shows our best guess of the computing power used to train the most powerful AI models over the past 10 years. In that time, this computing power has increased by a factor of 10 million, often in large jumps from generation to generation of models. The last five jumps have come from large language models and have taken us from systems unable to form coherent sentences to those that have mastered aspects of human language. Soon, perhaps in the first half of next year, we're on track to see another jump. New models, the red cross on this chart, may use 10 times the amount of compute, trained by just a handful of companies using huge new computing clusters that are being built as I speak. This jump is what exponential growth looks like. As before, the new models will make the previous jumps look small and insignificant. They'll use AI chips up to six times more powerful than before and will be some of the biggest projects undertaken in the history of technology. Now, this progress is exciting. I've long been a believer in the immense capacity for good that AI represents since I worked on an early system to detect breast cancer using computer vision almost 20 years ago. But all powerful technologies prompt questions about how we make them safe. Power and risk go hand in hand, from clinical trials for pharmaceuticals to international regulation of the nuclear industry, every emerging technology, if it is sufficiently powerful, necessitates a conversation about how we make it safe. And that's why we've come together today. These two days, are a brief moment of reflection along this curve, a moment to pause 
and shape its trajectory and its impact. The most advanced systems are being developed by a small community of experts, some of whom are in this room today. But it's not just those developers who will be held responsible for AI's consequences. It will be all of us as people empowered and entrusted to ensure that technology benefits humanity. I, like many in this room, am concerned about the trajectory we're on. Many have correctly stressed the existing harms from AI and the possibility of current or future systems undermining democracy, entrenching discrimination, or destabilizing our societies. And a number of leading experts are seriously concerned that uncontrolled advances in AI may lead to catastrophic consequences. I worry that a race to create powerful machines will outpace our ability to safeguard society. There's a wide range of beliefs in this room as to the certainty and severity of these risks. No one in this room knows for sure how or if these next jumps in computational power will translate to new model capabilities or harms. So over the course of the day, you'll hear about some of the work that our AI task force has done. We've been trying to ground these risks in empiricism and rigor. While I'm proud of our work, it's a tiny step in the face of a colossal challenge. And I'm so grateful to Secretary Raimondo for spinning up the US AI Safety Institute and for the partnership we will establish. Our current lack of understanding in the face of what may be a pretty critical moment in the history of technology is quite striking. History will remember this moment at Bletchley Park amidst this exponential. It will judge all of our ability to live up to this challenge, to find common ground amid disagreement, and to take concrete action in the face of uncertainty. It will judge us what we do and say over the next two days and the days to come. So let's make the most of this time together. Thank you, and what a fantastic range of speeches that was. We're now going to move on to our next panel. Our fifth speaker is Rajiv Chandra Shekhar, Minister of State for Election, Electrons, Electronics and Information Technology of India. He is a proven technology-minded government leader and an entrepreneur and has driven forward the AI agenda in India. He joins us today hot off the heels of the publication of his ministry of a major AI report, India AI 2023. Our sixth speaker is the world's first ever dedicated minister for artificial intelligence, His Excellency Omar Sultan Al Olomar. The United Emirates uh, the United Arab Emirates was indeed present in recognizing the future importance of AI across government and in the private sector. And I enjoyed speaking with him this morning at just how they saw that happening in the future and were so early to, to appoint him. Our seventh speaker, the Honorable Minister Bassan Tin Jaranji, is a pioneering a novel approach to the creation of an AI strategy for Nigeria and with his AI-enabled global search for contributions from experts of Nigerian descendants. As a co-founder of the leading innovation hub in Africa, the Honorable Minister is no stranger to using frontier technology safely to solve development challenges. So collectively, I cannot think of a better panel. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, the government of the United Kingdom, and uh, all members of the government of the United Kingdom for arranging this summit and for uh, certainly for inviting us as well. We have maintained uh, as government of India that international collaborations such as this, international conversations between countries, are extremely important as we move forward to shaping the future of tech at a time and in an era where technology is certainly throwing up 
the most exciting opportunities ever in the history of mankind. Our Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji has, uh, for several years, argued that the future of tech, whether it be innovation, whether it be partnerships, or indeed the institutional framework for regulating the, the technology and innovation for the common good of all humans and all mankind uh, should be driven by a coalition of nations rather than just one country or two countries. And that the institutional framework should be less episodic and a lot more sustained and with strategic clarity. Let me share the Indian perspective. Uh, certainly, mo some of you may know, most of you may uh, know this. We have rapidly digitized our economy in the last eight years. We have moved the digital economy, the needle on the digital economy from about 4.5% of total GDP to our target of 20% by 2526. We're at about 11% today. The digital economy and the innovation eco economy and the innovation ecosystem today is growing at about two and a half to three times faster than the, the non-digital part of the GDP. So for us, the all things digital, the digital economy, the innovation ecosystem represents real bread and butter, real goals and real objectives. And artificial intelligence for us, as we see it, is a kinetic enabler of the already accelerating, already expanding digital economy, innovation, growth, and governance. In a book that I just re read recently by DeepMind's founder, Mustafa Suleiman, he refers to the coming decade or the coming years as the next big wave. And we certainly see artificial intelligence as that. Uh, we are very clear on that AI represents a big opportunity for us, as well as we are extremely clear in our minds about what we need to do in terms of mitigating all of the other downsides that AI and indeed any emerging technology can uh, or will represent. Let me just share a bit uh, with you on uh, quick, quickly on what we believe is the way to look at AI. We look at uh, AI and indeed technology in general through the prism of openness, safety and trust and accountability. I think uh, there are we use words like AI for good. I certainly don't understand what that means. Is there an AI for bad that we are talking about? Uh, we, we certainly don't think there should be any, uh, any doubt in anybody's mind that the future of tech must be and always be only for the good and the progress and prosperity of uh, our collective uh, citizens of all our countries. Uh, Techno-optimism notwithstanding, I think there is a new regime, new framework that needs to be built where there is greater accountability of platforms on the issue of user harm. There's a greater accountability of platforms on ensuring safety and trust of all those who use their platforms, whether it is AI or in, indeed the broader general internet at large. Uh, I will just end quickly by saying this. We have learned in the last 10, 15 years as governments that by allowing innovation to get ahead of regulation, we open ourselves to the toxicity and the misinformation and the weaponization that we see on the internet today, uh, represented by social media. And we certainly can agree today that that is not what we should chart for the coming uh, years in terms of AI. We certainly want AI and the broader internet and tech to represent goodness, safety and trust, and underlying all of that, underpinning all of that, platforms and innovators that demonstrate accountability under law to all those who use it. Thank you. Seconds. Just on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start first and foremost by thanking the UK government for their kind uh, um, invitation and for convening us all here today. I think it is indeed appropriate that we're meeting on this premise, on these grounds, because the enigma of today is very different to the enigma of yesterday. The enigma of yesterday was indeed catastrophic, and indeed one that required compute to solve, the enigma of today is AI. It's trustworthy AI, and it's safe AI. So thank you for choosing the right venue, and thank you for convening the right crowd. I'd like to start off by saying that 
all efforts that we're seeing today around the world on artificial intelligence are definitely positive indications that the world is moving in the right direction. United States executive order on safe, secure, and trustworthy AI, or the UK just announcing its Institute for Artificial Intelligence, as well as the efforts that the UK is doing, we are moving in a direction that we have long been waiting for and long been calling for as a collective community, whether it's the experts in the room or governments that have been working on this file for a while. We today are at a pivotal moment in the history of intelligence. The gaze of future generations may either accuse us of not having done anything or stifling innovation and dimming the prospects for humanity. We must navigate this dichotomy together and place the brilliant minds who are developing this technology at the center of the conversation. The stakes are high and the benefits of AI on humanity are immense, but so are the risks that tag along. As governments, investing in the haven of safety is our primal step, as it should be with AI safety. Top minds in the field recommend allocating significant portion of AI resources towards ensuring safe and ethical use of this technology. And we as regulators should heed this call and do so proportionately to the AI that is being developed in our nations. Evaluating AI model capabilities is the next stride. The pulse of AI's capability beats with the rhythm of human ingenuity. However, every beat must be measured against a set of established standards that ensure that the technology we build serves humans and not the algorithm. Standards for extensive generic red teaming, as well as specific sectorial standards for critical infrastructure must be, must be developed and shared internationally, as the impact for AI will know no borders. For instance, there can be additional, these can be additionally tested um, across the world with countries like the UAE and others, to ensure that they are truly global, and thus creating a better testbed and ensuring that AI is better for everyone everywhere. Developing AI in the UAE, for example, has always been international from day one. We've always thought of the 200 nationalities that reside in the UAE and thought about their safety and security, whether it's on our land or across borders as well. Evidence-based governance is the cornerstone of the AI journey. The UAE promotes a pragmatic, principled approach to AI governance, focusing on governing the use cases rather than the technology itself. However, the next challenge will not be merely uh, about identifying what needs to be done by the government, but rather how quick it needs to be done. Therefore, a new form of governance that is both agile and endorsed by the private sector is necessary to effectively govern this technology. Transparency and ethics are our guiding principles. However, this dialogue needs to be inclusive of the global south and needs to ensure that AI safety leaves no one behind. We stand ready to collaborate as the UAE, we stand ready to innovate, and we stand ready to contribute towards a future where AI is a beacon for progress, is a beacon for safety, and a beacon for inclusivity. And we urge everyone to operate with that ethos. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm deeply honored to address this prestigious gathering. And of course, I'd like to appreciate our host for extending the invitation for Nigeria to be part of this special occasion. Um, as we gather, Today, we must acknowledge that our world is experiencing significant transformation driven by the increased application of digital technologies. These new technologies have ensured that access to information is increasingly ubiquitous while creating an extensive and interconnected web of networks. By democratizing access to knowledge, we now have a golden opportunity to share information, experiences, and also competencies in, revolu in, in, a, in a revolutionary manner that allows us to empower communities and nations that are traditionally unserved or underserved. In this digital age, 
Technological capability is not limited by geographical or socioeconomic classification. In fact, technological advancements now travel rapidly <coughs> at the speed of light within networks. In turn, creating platform for smart application of technologies that transcend borders, making it a powerful force for global economic development. As we enter into a new age of greater <coughs> possibilities with artificial intelligence, we do have now, we have, we, we, we have now been empowered to aggregate, process, contextualize knowledge that enables us to tackle complex societal and business challenges with very unique insights and intelligence that have previously been unavailable to us. AI, at its very core, offers our generation a historical opportunity to create ubiquitous access to insights and intelligence for global development. However, we must remain conscious of the needs to ensure the safe, ethical, and inclusive development of this phenomenon. We must take necessary steps to prevent the disenfranchisement of people due to unpleasant experiences and abuse and also misuse. This risk can further exacerbate existing socioeconomic inequalities that limits the significant impact that AI brings to our world. We must therefore ensure that the benefits of AI are accessible to all without discrimination or exclusion. By doing this, we will create a world that presents opportunity as a collective birthright and not as a privilege for a select few. As we do this, we will leverage the true transformative power of artificial intelligence for the common good of humanity. In conclusion, I'm not gonna take all my five minutes, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Let me reiterate the need for us to embrace the extensive opportunities AI offers to us to create a more inclusive and prosperous world. We must, however, be mindful to do this with a clear and intentional commitment to deploy in a safe and responsible manner. Working together as a global community, we will shape a future where AI becomes the tool for economic empowerment, improved quality of life, and global unity. I'd like to thank you all, and I look forward to seeing this summit become a launch pad for brighter and rewarding future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who's spoken this morning. I think the common theme was just how this is a true historic moment. I do believe that what we are agreeing here today, building on the Bletchley Declaration, will indeed be talked about for years and generations to come. Members of the public should have confidence that as a result, what we are discussing will result in the right safeguards being put in place at the right time and in the right way, so that we can seize the almost unlimited benefits of AI. The conversations over the next couple of days are, of course, only the start of that process to build our shared understanding of the risks and to consider how we can tackle them together. Today, we are moving one step closer to setting a new course in AI safety. And I'm really grateful to my colleagues who have already set the tone of the sessions to follow both today and tomorrow. And I'm looking forward to, with great anticipation, the roundtable discussions getting underway shortly by such an esteemed group of experts and policymakers from across the globe. So I wish you well in the conversations later and before the break, I would like you to hear now from His Majesty the King. We are witnessing one of the greatest technological leaps in the history of human endeavor. The rapid rise of powerful artificial intelligence is considered by many of the greatest thinkers of our age to be no less significant, no less important than the discovery of electricity, uh, the splitting of the atom, the creation of the World Wide Web, or even the harnessing of fire. AI holds the potential to completely transform life as we know it, to help us better treat and perhaps even cure conditions like cancer, heart disease and Alzheimer's, to hasten our journey towards net zero 
and realize a new era of potentially limitless clean green energy, even just to help us make our everyday lives a bit easier. However, if we are to realize the untold benefits of AI, then we must work together on combating its significant risks too. AI continues to advance with ever greater speed towards models that some predict could surpass human abilities, even human understanding. There is a clear imperative to ensure that this rapidly evolving technology remains safe and secure. And because AI does not respect international boundaries, this mission demands international coordination and collaboration. To support this global effort, the United Kingdom is proud to host this summit in Bletchley Park, the birthplace of modern computing, where Alan Turing famously cracked the Enigma code and laid the foundations for a new digital age. Transitions like the one AI is heralding always present profound challenges, especially in preparing for unintended consequences. It is incumbent on those with responsibility to meet these challenges, to protect people's privacy and livelihoods, which are essential to both our economic and psychological well-being, to secure our democracies from harm, and to ensure the benefits of new technology are shared by all. I've always believed in the importance of holding a conversation, both within and across societies, to address such great challenges, of bringing governments and the public sector together with civil society and the private sector in that conversation, adhering to the values, tenets of faith and laws that we all hold so dear. That is how the international community has sought to tackle climate change, to light a path to net zero and safeguard the future of our planet. We must similarly address the risks presented by AI with a sense of urgency, unity and collective strength. So, on behalf of the United Kingdom, I want to thank you all for the vital role you are playing in this shared endeavour, for laying the foundations of a lasting consensus on AI safety and for ensuring that this immensely powerful technology is indeed a force for good in this world.
Please welcome U.S. Ambassador to the Court of St. James, Jane Hartley. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Embassy London. In just a few minutes, we will have the privilege of hearing from the Vice President of the United States on a topic that will affect us all, the future of artificial intelligence. A technology that can change the way we learn, change the way we work, and change the way we create, but a technology that also carries serious risks. Risks to privacy, to national security, to public safety, and, of course, to democratic values. The Biden-Harris administration understands that governments have a vital role to play in managing those risks. And we want to make sure that AI becomes a force for good. Our vice president is here to work with our friend and our ally, the United Kingdom and all other partners from around the world to establish a strong international approach to this critical issue. As United States Ambassador to the UK, I've seen how closely our governments collaborate, how our militaries train together, how our intelligence agencies share our most highly, tightly held secrets. And on the biggest challenge facing our world, from climate change to Ukraine to the Middle East, we work together, driven by our commitment to values and to common goals. And artificial intelligence is no different. And I believe the challenge of managing its development will become another area of critical and important cooperation in our special relationship with the United Kingdom. I want to thank Vice President Harris for coming to the UK and especially for her thoughtful leadership on AI. She has a long track record of fighting for consumers, for seniors, for women and girls, and for all communities. As she has worked her entire career to protect people from harm while at the same time promoting innovation. She has convened CEOs at the White House and helped drive voluntary safety commitments from leaders in the artificial intelligence industry. She's brought civil rights groups, consumer advocates, and labor communities to the policy-making table. And tomorrow, she'll represent the United States at the Global Summit on AI Safety hosted by Prime Minister Sunak. So we're very proud and excited to have her here at Embassy London, and I personally want to thank her for her leadership and greatly look forward to what she has to say today. Thank you so much.
please welcome the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Have a seat. Good afternoon. It's good to see everyone. Ambassador Hartley, thank you for the warm welcome that you gave us last night and today and for inviting us to be here with you. And thank you for your extraordinary leadership on behalf of the President and me and our country. And it is, of course, my honor to be with everyone here at the United States Embassy in London, as well as to be with former Prime Minister Theresa May and all of the leaders from the private sector, civil society, academia, and our many international partners. So tomorrow I will participate in Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's Global Summit on AI Safety to continue to advance global collaboration on safe and responsible use of AI. Today I will speak more broadly about the vision and the principles that guide America's work on AI. President Biden and I believe that all leaders from government, civil society, and the private sector have a moral, ethical, and societal duty to make sure that AI is adopted and advanced in a way that protects the public from potential harm and that ensures that everyone is able to enjoy its benefits. AI has the potential to do profound good, to develop powerful new medicines, to treat and even cure the diseases that have for generations plagued humanity, to dramatically improve agricultural production, to help address global food insecurity, and to save countless lives in the fight against the climate crisis. But just as AI has the potential to do profound good, it also has the potential to cause profound harm. From AI-enabled cyber attacks at a scale beyond anything we've seen before, to AI-formulated bioweapons that could endanger the lives of millions of people, these threats are often referred to as the existential threats of AI because, of course, they could endanger the very existence of humanity. These threats, without question, are profound, and they demand global action. But let us be clear, there are additional threats that also demand our action threats that are currently causing harm and which to many people also feel existential. Consider, for example, when a senior is kicked off his health care plan because of a faulty AI algorithm. Is that not existential for him? When a woman is threatened by an abusive partner with explicit deep fake photographs is that not existential for her? When a young father is wrongfully imprisoned because of biased AI facial recognition, is that not existential for his family? And when people around the world cannot discern fact from fiction because of a flood of AI-enabled mis- and disinformation. I ask, is that not existential for democracy? Accordingly, to define AI safety, I offer that we must consider and address the full spectrum of AI risk, threats to humanity as a whole, as well as threats to individuals, communities, to our institutions, and to our most vulnerable populations. 
We must manage all these dangers to make sure that AI is truly safe. So many of you here know my mother was a scientist. And she worked at one of our nation's many publicly funded research universities, which have long served as laboratories of invention, creativity, and progress. My mother had two goals in her life, to raise her two daughters and end breast cancer. At a ver very early age then, I learned from her about the power of innovation to save lives, to uplift communities, and move humanity forward. I believe history will show that this was the moment when we had the opportunity to lay the groundwork for the future of AI. And the urgency of this moment must then compel us to create a collective vision of what this future must be. A future where AI is used to advance human rights and human dignity, where privacy is protected and people have equal access to opportunity, where we make our democracies stronger and our world safer. A future where AI is used to advance the public interest. And that is the future President Joe Biden and I are building. Before generative AI captured global attention, President Biden and I convened leaders from across our country, from computer scientists to civil rights activists to business leaders and legal scholars, all to help make sure that the benefits of AI are shared equitably and to address predictable threats including deep fakes, data privacy violations, and algorithmic discrimination. And then we created the AI Bill of Rights. Building on that, earlier this week, President Biden directed the United States government to promote safe, secure, and trustworthy AI, a directive that will have wide-ranging impact. For example, our administration will establish a national safety reporting program on the unsafe use of AI in hospitals and medical facilities. Tech companies will create new tools to help consumers discern if audio and visual content is AI generated. And AI developers will be required to submit the results of AI safety testing to the United States government for review. In addition, I am proud to announce that President Biden and I have established the United States AI Safety Institute, which will create rigorous standards to test the safety of AI models for public use. Today, we are also taking steps to establish requirements that when the United States government uses AI, it advances the public interest. And we intend that these domestic AI policies will serve as a model for global policy. Understanding that AI developed in one nation can impact the lives and livelihoods of billions of people around the world. Fundamentally, it is our belief that technology with global impact deserves global action. And so, to provide order and stability in the midst of global technological change, I firmly believe that we must be guided by a common set of understandings among nations. And that is why the United States will continue to work with our allies and partners to apply existing international rules and norms to AI and work to create new rules and norms. To that end, earlier this year, the United States announced a set of principles for responsible development, deployment, and use of military AI and autonomous capabilities. It includes a rigorous legal review process for AI decision-making and a commitment 
that AI systems always operate with international and within international humanitarian law. Today I am also announcing that 30 countries have joined our commitment to the responsible use of military AI, and I call on more nations to join. In addition to all of this, the United States will continue to work with the G7, the United Nations, and a diverse range of governments from the global north to the global south to promote AI safety and equity around the world. But let us agree, governments alone cannot address these challenges. Civil society groups and the private sector also have an important role to play. Civil society groups advocate for the public interest. They hold the public and private sectors to account and are essential to the health and stability of our democracies. As with many other important issues, AI policy requires the leadership and partnership of civil society. And today, in response to my call, I am proud to announce that 10 top philanthropies have committed to join us to protect workers' rights, advance transparency, prevent discrimination, drive innovation in the public interest, and help build international rules and norms for the responsible use of AI. These organizations have already made an initial commitment of $200 million in furtherance of these principles. And so today I call on more civil society organizations to join us in this effort. In addition to our work with civil society, President Biden and I will continue to engage with the private companies who are building this technology. Today, commercial interests are leading the way in the development and application of large language models and making decisions about how these models are built, trained, tested, and secured. These decisions have the potential to impact all of society. As such, President Biden and I have had extensive engagement with the leading AI companies to establish a minimum, minimum baseline of responsible AI practices. The result is a set of voluntary company commitments, which range from commitments to report vulnerabilities discovered in AI models to keeping those models secure from bad actors. Let me be clear, these voluntary commitments are an initial step toward a safer AI future, with more to come. Because, as history has shown, in the absence of regulation and strong government oversight, some technology companies choose to prioritize profit over the well-being of their customers, the safety of our communities, and the stability of our democracies. An important way to address these challenges, in addition to the work we have already done, is through legislation. Legislation that strengthens AI safety without stifling innovation. In a constitutional government like the United States, the executive branch and the legislative branch should work together to pass laws that advance the public interest. And we must do so swiftly as this technology rapidly advances. President Biden and I are committed to working with our partners in Congress to codify future meaningful AI and privacy protections. And I will also note, even now, ahead of congressional action, there are many existing laws and regulations that reflect our nation's longstanding commitment to the principles of privacy, transparency, accountability, and consumer protection. These laws and regulations are enforceable and currently apply to AI companies. President Biden and I reject the false choice that suggests we can either protect the public or advance innovation. 
We can and we must do both. The actions we take today will lay the groundwork for how AI will be used in the years to come. So I will end with this. This is a moment of profound opportunity. The benefits of AI are immense. It could give us the power to fight the climate crisis, make medical and scientific breakthroughs, explore our universe, and improve everyday life for people around the world. So let us seize this moment. Let us recognize this moment we are in. As leaders from government, civil society, and the private sector, let us work together to build a future where AI creates opportunity, advances equity, fundamental freedoms and rights being protected. Let us work together to fulfill our duty to make sure artificial intelligence is in the service of the public interest. I thank you all.
Good afternoon. Please welcome to the stage the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology of the United Kingdom, Michelle Donnellan. Thank you. And before we move on to our closing plenary session, I would like to take this opportunity for us to reflect a little bit on the strides that we've made so far and delve into the top lines that were coming out of our roundtable. So can I invite onto the stage, please, those chairs of this morning's sessions? This one. I'll, I'll take this one. Okay, we're just going to uh, have a few seconds, I'm hoping, from everybody just giving us the, the top information from each of the sessions. And I'm going to start with Minister Champagne. Thank you very much, sir. Madam Secretary, what a pleasure uh, to see you all. Thank you very much. And can we give you a big round of applause for an amazing summit? Let's start, let's, let's start with that. Uh, I, I think that everyone, uh, you, you deserve uh, to be thanked for your leadership and everything assembled. I say it's the right people at the right time. Uh, listen, our, our session was really about the, the global AI risk, and, and I would say there's three A's for me, acknowledgement. I think there's a broad acknowledgement that AI uh, could be empowering malicious actors around the world. We talk about biological weapons, uh, chemical weapons, but also disinformation, which is very, very, um, I read in the material, some of you may have had the same material, but there will be... Uh, apparently uh, something like uh, 50 elections in 2024 that will affect 4 billion people. And if you think about deep fakes and all that, I think there is a general consensus uh, among at least our group that uh, these risks are real and uh, the technology will be enabling and could be enabling people. And it's all about scale, scope, and speed. And we should all be acknowledging that. Now, once you have acknowledged the issue, I think we move into action. That's the other eight. I think there's a broad consensus that we need to take action, both domestically and internationally. A, a number of people have said that we should have an IPC panel on AI safety. Uh, obviously, what the UK and the US are talking about, uh, making sure that we can test these systems independently. This was all welcome. There was a lot of discussion around that. And, and certainly, uh, some analogy were made with the nuclear field that you know, it's incumbent upon the manufacturer, in this case, the developer, uh, to make sure that their system are intrinsically safe uh, before they're put into action or into the market. So there was a number of, of very, very interesting discussion on that. And, and finally, uh, colleagues understood that we need to converge uh, because we can take action domestically with voluntary code of conducts or uh, national legislation, but at the end of the day, no one can insulate himself from, from the risk. So we need to have global governance. And there was discussion around GP, around the United Nations, and other body who can do that for us. And finally, uh, I think we need to adapt. That's the other A, because clearly everyone understood that it's very difficult to forecast or foreshadow what AI could do over the next 5, 10 years exponentially, and, and therefore making sure that our regulation would be adapting. And I would say um, this is very much the start of a discussion that you've done, Madam Secretary. I would say let's seize the moment, let's be ambitious, and let's give confidence to people. Because if we want to, in order to maximize or to realize the benefits of AI, we need to uh, obviously deal uh, with uh, managing the risk. And once we have managed the risk, we can obviously realize the opportunities. And the way to do that for me is obviously having these guardrails uh, that will build trust. I think we need to build trust with people. So let's seize the moment, let's be ambitious, and let's give, let's give confidence to people that we get it and we're going to act in the interest of humanity. Merci tout le monde. Thank you. And our session dealt with the question of uh, loss of control, humans losing control over AI models. Um, and it was a very rich discussion. There were very divergent views, but I think we could discern three themes at least. The first is that um, if we look at current AI systems today, they do not yet pose a real risk of loss of control. They require human prompting and generally fail when asked to plan over time towards a goal. 
and current models also have limited ability to take actions in the real world. However, it appeared quite clear that future models are likely to improve on all of these dimensions, even if the case has not been fully made that we will one day uh, still experience a severe loss of control over AI models. Um, having said that, in the nearer term, it is more likely for humans to give systems disproportionate control than it is for systems to take that control from us. So I would say that this is the first set of uh, uh, themes that uh, emerged. The second is that there was this interesting idea of what if we could uh, continue to enjoy the benefits of current AI models, but press the pause button on the development of frontier AI models in order that we could buy ourselves time and develop the capability to exercise proper control over these advanced frontier models. Um, this sounds good in theory. Uh, the difficulty lies with the fact that you can have responsible de developers that are willing to comply with such a rule. But what levers do we actually have to ensure that the bad actors don't go ahead to develop uh, frontier models anyway without our knowledge? And what could we in fact do to stop this from happening? So the question of levers and incentives uh, is something that we have to address too. Uh, be that as it may, even as we try to investigate these questions more fully and in order to satisfy ourselves that we have the right answers, um, it's, it's important for us to focus on uh, actionable items. And there were also three that uh, w uh, we agreed uh, w would be no-brainers that uh, they are no regrets move. The first is that we should grow global expertise in AI safety and R&D. And the second is in terms of deepening collaborations in AI testing and auditing. And also then thirdly, we should continue multitask, multi-stakeholder exchanges in order to arrive at better understanding of the issues and how we can mitigate against the risk. So I would say that um, on that note, we had a really uh, interesting discussion. And I also like to echo Minister Champagne's uh, thanks to uh, our colleagues from the United Kingdom for organizing the AI Safety Summit and for assembling this really excellent group of colleagues for us to make progress together. Thank you very much. So actually, when, when Teal talk about you know, the pause giant AI, uh, experiment. The, uh, this morning, uh, me and Max Tafmar was talking about, you know, are we successful for, you know, the post giant AI uh, models uh, letter? Actually, what do we mean by successful? Actually, now we're having more than 20 countries talking together about AI safety. This is already a huge success along that line because, you know, the, the, the aim of the letter is to raise the concern on AI safety. So for that, we should thank all together to UK. Thank you so much. <laughs> having, having more than 20 countries all together to talk about it. Uh, for, for the unexpected um, advances in our uh, round table, I would like to say it's not only about unexpected uh, advances, it's also about unexpected failures um, that we have to face. This is the core, I would say, for uh, the, the effort on um, AI safety, that can we really make a good prediction? The answer would be no. But can we stop trying? The answer would be also no. So this, I think this is the importance and beauty uh, of the discussion. So we've been to also talking about you know, the, the importance or, or possible failures because of open source for AI safety. This is a really challenging topic because in my generation, when we were starting working on computer science, we were getting so much benefit from Linux, BSD, and now when we we're working on large-scale AI models, we have to think about whether open source, the paradigm for open source can continue because that it raises so much concerns and risks when larger scale models with very large uncertainties open to everyone, and how can we just ensure that it was not really misused and abused? The challenge is not only for AI scientists, it's really for the whole world. How can we make a balance, or can we make a balance? 
The final point that I would like to make here to represent my group is really about you know, the domestic and international collaborations. For this morning, we've heard uh, that the, both the UK and also the US will have its version of AI Safety Institute. Actually, we think that we should all have something like an AI Safety Institute for, for our own country, but that's not enough. We need to have an AI Safety Network working really together just to hold the hope that maybe we can, you know, solve some of the unpredicted advances and unpredicted failures. By the release of the UN uh, Advisory uh, Board uh, on AI, um, when I was talking to uh, our dearest uh, Amandeep, uh, Amandeep uh, was saying is that you know, the future of AI, especially uh, in the, on the occasion of UN, um, is not really about the advanced countries like China and the US and how can you compete or share the benefit. It's really about the rest of the world when we are having opportunities to develop and to get our benefits. What about the rest of the world? Will the superpowers in AI bring fundamental challenges to the rest of the world? I think that's really why we have to hold hands together, not only by the efforts from UNESCO, ITU, uh, but really on the UN platform, and also for, for these like, like efforts like the Global AI Safety uh, Summit that ho currently hold 20 countries together. I would hope maybe for the rest of the, for the next years or two, you can have hold like 40 countries. Thank you. Well, just to illustrate how successful the summit has been, people in our working group that focused on the societal risks of the deployment of frontier AI models, participants stayed for an extra 15 minutes so that everybody who wanted to speak could actually speak. And I thought that was very, very kind and showed the commitment to uh, listening and engaging. Um, if there is one thing you remember from what our group um, wanted to present, it is that known societal risks of the deployment of frontier AI models are existential to democracy, to human rights, to civil rights, to fairness, uh, inequality, think about economic inequality, access to healthcare and other kinds of services, but also in a global context, the inequality between those who already have access and those who don't. But then we also talked about how we can better use the laws that already exist or the best practices that we can benefit from. So for example, to ensure that there is clarification of how existing rules apply, for example, privacy in the context of AI, intellectual property rights, but also liability was discussed. And also um, besides laws, how we might learn from the field of trust and safety uh, of best practices in terms of making AI deployment in our society today much more safe and fair. Then another recommendation is to have more comprehensive and better quality technical evaluations. The notion of evaluation is easily shared, but what do we really mean? Can we include more concrete and societal metrics and be contextual to the applications in the real world to make sure that the evaluations are continuous as the life cycles of these AI products evolve? That includes investing in basic research to understand better how systems work, but also to inquire how government's own uses of systems work so that the government can be a better um, leader in the use of artificial intelligence. And we discussed how public procurement is an opportunity for governments to set guidelines by doing, uh, and we also saw that coming back in the executive order, for example. Now, the two last points, also important, talked a lot about risk, but not to miss out on the opportunities that AI can offer to solve major problems, to actually strengthen democracy. So we talked about risk to democracy, but also opportunities for AI to strengthen it, digest large volumes of information, for example, to overcome the cr climate crisis and to address societal bias, not to contribute to it. And lastly, uh, there were a lot of participants who wanted to emphasize how important it is to include 
citizens. Young people were mentioned, um, but really to recommend governments that when they put together an AI advisory body, for example, that maybe they also include a random sample of citizens, not just experts, not just multidisciplinary experts, but people who will be living through the consequences of policies made. And so um, in recognition of how important the multi-stakeholder engagement and perspectives really are in uh, governing AI to prevent the risks, reap the benefits as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you for those incredible insights. And if I could ask for a seamless swap now for the chairs of this afternoon's sessions, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll do the same again. I'll begin with Rebecca. Thank you, Secretary, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to assure you that we were the hardest working round table <laughs> of the day. Uh, we went long, um, and I also need to apologize to the participants in the round table. Um, I suppose that's appropriate as a, as a Canadian. We had detailed <laughs> policy proposals in almost every uh, intervention that was made, and I will not be able to go into them, but there was just such substance. It was a, it was a super conversation, and I thank everyone uh, who was around the table. And that really um, shows that we began with speaking to uh, a number of leaders from government who made it very clear that artificial intelligence and attending to the guardrails as well as the capacities for innovation were core to their mandates, and there were a number of initiatives underway. I also thought it was very thoughtful that the leaders were clear about their need to build their own capacity within government, acknowledging that government can move more slowly sometimes than technology and innovation, but really thinking about how to build capacity. And this summit came up as a, a great example of ways in which uh, Leaders can come together, learn from each other. We talked about developing shared resources, shared ways to, to share what's working, what's not working, using uh, different international uh, conversations such as standards and the focus on interoperability, um, thinking about ways in which science can be done more openly, where research can be supported to really build capacity within government. That would be my first uh, take away from the conversation. The second was really a clear consensus that regulation and innovation go hand in hand, uh, that these are not two ends of the spectrum and binary choices, but rather in this moment we need both, and that regulation can in fact drive innovation and vice versa. And we heard a number of different regulatory proposals from product safety laws to liability approaches uh, through to things like sandboxing, sandboxing and building capacity moving forward. And then the third point we heard is that we really need to go beyond this notion of artificial intelligence um, as being one single entity that policymakers need to respond to. But in this moment, as we move from uh, foundation through to frontier models, we need to go the next level down and dig deeper into capabilities, domains, approaches for release, um, and really understand what both the potential and the risks and the harms are across the life cycle of these different models and different approaches. Um, and there were a number of proposals here. Uh, one of them was uh, very specific around the way in which the safety institutes could be used to do some very specific work to inform regulation and action moving forward. And then finally, the last point, and I'm not just saying this because I believe in multi-stakeholderism, but there was a lot of belief in the importance of creating multi-stakeholder communities of action. And particularly because of the trust that governments have 
uh, with regard to their citizens and attending to education and skills development and literacy and closing that digital divide so that citizens can feel both protected and also enabled and inspired to innovate and to harness this potential for all. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Not to get competitive, Rebecca, but in 75 minutes, we solved international cooperation. It's all done right here. Uh, Madam Minister, it's an honor to be here and to have you all as colleagues and collaborators. We um, did not solve international cooperation, but we had a robust discussion and converged on three basic points. The first is that as we look to what the UN, the G20, the G7, the OECD, and all these different efforts can do on international collaboration, we have to start with having the right values. And there was quite a bit of agreement around the table about the importance of continued innovation, about digital solidarity and respect for different countries and their ways of operating, about being inclusive and trying to make sure that this is not just the province of the global north, as it were, and about being aware of the risks, not just the ongoing uh, increase in risks as frontier models get better, but even what the existing models can do to some extent. And uh, the deputy minister from Ukraine talked to us eloquently about that. Second, as we look to the future, we need not only a set of values and principles that the world converge, converge around, but implementable realistic action, much of it perhaps at the local level, the national level, but with some mechanism to trust but verify and understand what's happening at the, at the national level. Third, we talked quite a bit about what can be done concretely in the next 12 months. And here there was a sense of the importance of a better shared understanding of the capabilities of frontier models. I would express also a hope, maybe riffing off some of the comments in our session, that that effort perhaps jump-started by a report on the state of the science that I know will be called for can lead to an international panel on AI safety that a number of folks here have talked about. Second, uh, a hope of developing a more coordinated approach to research. And here, the institute that is being rolled out today, tomorrow, might be really a cornerstone to a set of activities in different institutes around the world to pool research and knowledge and to have that research be secure and safe and private where it needs to be and a little bit more public where it can be. Last but certainly not least, the international collaborations and partnerships that can develop need to be focused on both the benefits, the well-being that AI can bring to billions of people around the world that are struggling to get access to health care, to better education, for example, to cleaner water, but at the same time be mindful of risks, and that ought to feed into a governance mechanism that we can all trust. And that leads me to the very last point, which is a real awareness that this summit is playing a key role, but it's existing amidst a G7 process, the Hiroshima process that our Japanese colleagues have helped to move forward that has resulted in some helpful principles around the code of conduct that the UN is participating in through its new high-level advisory board that the OECD is taking part in. So um, all of us, as we are networked into these processes, can find ways over the next 12 months to bring that together as much as possible so that we fail and not, um, so we succeed and not fail. Uh, much better that way. <laughs> it's been a long day, what can I say? <laughs> Thank you. Well, those of you who are in my team, you know, don't you, really? Um, that was our question, what should the scientific community do? And we decided, actually, the current models are really not the answer. Uh, so we had four discussions. The first one was that. Uh, we do really need a better set of models that are engineered with new architectures engineered to be safe by design. We have a lot to learn from uh, existing uh, disciplines like safety engineering. One of the things we need to add in is non-removable off switches. Uh, we need to discuss open and closed release, but not too heatedly. And in those discussions, we have to admit that size really does matter. Also, uh, it was pointed out to us in this discussion about this whole new uh, engineered set of models that we did actually have to have a bit of epistemic modesty and that uh, uncertainty is rife in the, all of this. And then, of course, we came to the issue, but that's what we'd like to have. Uh, what, what are we going to do with the models that we've got at the moment? 
So we need to understand the existing risks and the number of actors involved in designing AI, evaluating throughout the life cycle, and deciding uh, which values will be used in those evaluations is currently tiny. So we need to do something about broadening out that conversation. Uh, the burden of proof on safety clearly uh, should remain with the vendors, and the scientific community's role is to design the tests to demonstrate safety for policymakers to impose. Uh, whoa, interesting. We need a list of uh, open research questions, uh, which we will gather together. Those 75 minutes weren't enough for us to make that list. We're going to do that uh, by correspondence in the next couple of days and find a way to publish uh, a, a list of open research questions. And there are other things about the way we should do research together as well. So first of all, we would like to draw on many, many methodologies. Clearly, there are many technical questions here, but there are also many, many social questions as well. Um, we, Sarah, our, our permanent secretary, pointed out that time is of the essence. We are going to need to do a lot of this very fast, and for that reason, we're going to need to decide which are the most important questions, focus on those, find ways to get answers quickly, while somehow, clearly in tension, uh, keeping a, some breadth of approach going. No, and I've left to last because it's most important and it's come up again and again in other people's uh, discussions is the issue of inclusivity. Whose conversation is this? This needs to be everybody's conversation because these issues uh, affect, affect all citizens. So we need to learn from, we need to learn the lesson of the concentration of power that has ended up in the hands of a very small number of people because of the way the internet evolved. And if we can, we need to avoid that happening again. We also need an inclusivity that recognises big geographical differences at the moment, not only in who gets to speak, who gets to research, and who benefits. And we need to include, uh, we, we need linguistic inclusion so that this is not just a technology for a small number of languages. And again, to repeat things that have already be, been said, we need to find ways to hear from the public, not just consult with the public, but actually hear what they have to say to us because there are many voices that need to be heard in response to these questions that we've been asking today. Those voices are, it's us who need to learn how to hear those queries. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much to our afternoon panel chairs who were quite competitive, I must say. <laughs> Obviously, none of them were in our session, which was naturally the best. But um, in the session that I chaired, which was about responsible capability scaling, there was a recognition of the role it plays, but also that that is just the baseline. And it doesn't, of course, replace the need for government to set standards. And there was a debate about how much we should aim to scale. And a key point was also made in regards to the importance of secure by design in relation to cyber security. And lastly, there was a consensus on the need for trusted external organisations to run the benchmarks that determine risk. Uh, and many of the contributors referenced the UK and the US announcements of institutes. So I would like to thank our afternoon chairs. <laughs> Now, I was told that there were some really insightful, interesting comments that were made across the sessions today, and we tried to uh, take just a few of them to give people another insight into what went on. Now, these people that have been selected have two minutes. I'm also told we might actually cut the mic if people get a bit carried away. So we're going to be a bit disciplined here, otherwise we'll be here till 10 o'clock. So if I just call out the names, and there is a roving Mike. First of all, we have Francine. Thank you. Um, hopefully wave if I'm about to get my mic cut. Um, <laughs> so, quite a day. Um, it's great that we've had these meetings today. They've put so much energy into something that's really important, and I'd really like to see it evolve and deepen a lot. Um, and the conversation today uh, reinforced for me that the summit's not basically about technology or regulation, it's basically about people. Um, it's about uh, the people who make technology, regulate technology, and the people whose lives are affected by the technology. So we need to understand how technology impacts people's lives. And to Angela's point in the scientific community readout, um, we need to include... Uh, 
lost my lost my lost my place. Uh, we need to include the people whose uh, lives are are affected by this, and uh, we need to have um, real understanding of the social values, the risks and the harms. So it's baked into development and deployment of tech, and we're not doing that yet. Um, yet, I say, it's not, we can't. We're not doing it yet. Um, so everyone in this room wants to see the benefits of AI tech are realised, and the Bletchley Declaration this morning, I think, articulates that really well. Um, but we've still got two paths, so one where people are anxious and mistrustful about technology and potentially suffer harms, and another where they're safe enough to have it in their lives. Um, and we can't get to that second path without regulation backed by law, um, informed by um, evidence of on-the-ground tools and mechanisms, which we've been talking about today. Um, so it's great to see so much energy today being directed towards that and towards thinking about risks and mitigations, but if we can't have the incentives for everyone to stick to the mitigations, it, it doesn't help. Um, so we can look to domains where we've had good mitigations and we've, where we've done good regulation already. So we've got confidence in things like, um, you know, we'll fly in planes without worrying they'll fall out of the sky or anything terrible will happen. We, we'll take medicines and, and feel confident about that. Um, we've got no substitute for regulation to use these impactful but also sometimes risky technologies well. Um, so getting really concrete, um, here in the UK, the government's got a couple of live opportunities to address this uh, in the King's speech or the Data Protection Bill which I really hope are taken up. Um, I'm really encouraged also by the tone of today to think that other nations are also going to take up similar opportunities to move um, fairly quickly on all of this. And, and in parallel, we as, as members of civil society, and I don't speak just for Ada Lovelace Institute here, but for the wider civil society group here, um, will continue to build evidence for how we'll make these technologies work for people in society. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I call upon Deb next, please? Hi, hello. Uh, I'm Deb Raji. Uh, I'm a fellow at Mozilla. I'm also um, a researcher at UC Berkeley. Um, and um, I think my takeaway from the day is that every country has their own AI strategy. Every corporation has their high-level AI principles. Um, and some of these have been floating around for years. And it's time, uh, it seems like now is the right time to translate some of that high-level thinking and the, the, the um, consolidation around high-level principles into uh, practical, detailed, concrete plans, um, translate it into an articulation of what best practices look like, what actual technical standards look like, um, articulate our expectations for these technologies, especially across high-stakes domains, um, and get to the point where we can actually um, make some practical progress on holding uh, various companies and other stakeholders accountable for the ways in which they develop, design, and deploy AI systems. I think something else that came up across various conversations was the need for role models in this translation work um, from sort of high level thinking about this problem to the more practical domain that we're entering. So thinking about, uh, there was very, across various conversations, there's been repeated mention of the aerospace industry as a role model. Uh, the automobile industry, um, there was a great analogy that was brought forward by a professor in Singapore about in the automobile industry, there's manufacturing standards around the vehicle, but there's also licenses for the drivers. There's also infrastructural uh, design for the roads and the safety of the um, environment in which these systems are deployed. These are incredible um, models that we can learn from in our design of these systems and how we regulate these systems. Also mentioning role models, um, there was a lot of discussion about learning from each other. Um, various national uh, ministers discussing specific case studies with each other. Uh, there was a discussion of a shared repository of case studies um, and, and shared practices and strategies um, that could be, or you know, a recurring event such as this one, um, uh, to discuss sort of practical progress on some of these these more localized uh, interventions when it comes to enforcement. Um, again, uh, speaking to that national, uh, international coordination, there was a lot of discussion as well about the need for standards and guidance at that international level also being a more concrete effort. Um, and then finally, um, I think something I've also learned from the conversations today and I've reflected on today um, is that if AI uh, doesn't work for everyone, it, it, it doesn't work at all. Um, there are you know, various communities countries that are part of, not part of that national conversation. Um, you have various folks mentioned countries in Africa and the global south um, where these large language models are not working in their local languages and are not necessarily bringing them any concrete benefits or making failures that have not been adequately tested in their context. Um, also thinking about uh, individuals that are from marginalized or underrepresented groups um, uh, where they're misrepresented or underrepresented in the data and so are not experiencing any of the benefits of the deployment of this technology. 
and in fact are being put at risk by the widespread deployment of this technology without thinking about testing for their particular specific context and use case and population. Um, and so um, I'm excited to sort of see where these things go moving forward and how we're going to sort of build a, a practical, pragmatic path um, that is inclusive and effective in bringing those benefits to a wider population without putting anyone at further risk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And next up we have Brian. Hi everyone, this is Brian from Concordia AI. We are an AI safety organization based in Beijing. What an incredible day we have had here at the Bletchley Park. So I would just like to commend the UK for making this happen. And I would like to share three key messages. One is the world clearly has a shared interest in ensuring global AI safety. The risk from Frontier AI that we discussed in the morning from uh, catastrophic misuse to unexpected dangerous capabilities to the potential loss of human control, they do not respect national borders. And we have a collective responsibility to protect the present as well as future generations to come. The second, we have much to gain when we work together as a global community. When we encourage international collaboration between researchers around the world, we will have better AI safety solutions. As countries or develop governance frameworks for AI, we have this golden window of opportunity to exchange lessons and you know, learn from each other. And there's also the right timing to really work towards international institutions to govern the risk as well as the benefits uh, from further advances in AI. Third, we must continue to include and empower the voices from the global south. As AI capabilities proliferate over time, uh, the success of global AI governance regime would ultimately depend on the buy-in from as many countries in the world as, as, as possible. And as advanced AI systems could impact all of humanity, uh, giving everyone a voice on how this should go is also morally the right thing to do. So in closing, um, let us carry forward the spirit of openness and cooperation from our time together at the Bletchley Park. This is only the beginning. Uh, and let's get to work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Martin? Thank you, Secretary of State. As you said, this is the start of a global conversation about the risks of AI, which is timely and urgent. And I look forward to further conversations now we've learned in South Korea and in France next year. We have a window of opportunity that's open for AI safety and governance, but that window will close. So for me, the key question for all of us is what will we regret not having done 10 years from now? First, I think we have to be clear, and I think this was probably present in all the groups, about what we are not talking about. I think there's still a tension as to whether we're talking about AI risks today or AI risks in the future and how they're linked. And I don't think we'll solve it in this room, but we will solve it by building the community of actors working on these issues and encouraging them to work together. Second, I think we need to be clear that AI is about values. It's political and it reflects the values, the mindset, the ways of looking at the world of its creators and of the data sets it is built upon. Abiba Bihani did a fantastic presentation on this at the AI Society Forum yesterday, which I encourage everyone to see. We need to bend AI to our vision, to our values. Third, Let's use this global conversation to see where we have different perspectives and work through them together. For example, open source. Is it friend or foe? Friends for risk today, foe for risk tomorrow? Hard law or voluntary commitments? I think we need to be quite wary of blunt dichotomies here and again, work through them together. So to finish, overall I think it's really critical to anchor our conversations in the values that we share. And as I hear them, Accountability is a really key one. For AI to be successful, it has to be accountable. It cannot be the preserve or the responsibility of technology companies alone. And here I think there's a vital role for civil society to play, for funders. For example, we were talking about making the market for algorithmic auditing. Second, responsibility, that we companies, governments and civil society all have a joint responsibility to ensure these systems don't fall into the wrong hands. And thirdly, many people have spoken about this in different ways. Participation, engagement, openness, 
bringing our citizens with us and work with them, our communities being engaged. Open source AI infrastructure is a key example of this, an incredible infrastructure, and we were talking earlier today, powered by volunteers around the world, and that drives everything from electric car to banking, to mitigate current and future harms from AI systems, I think we need to embra embrace and reflect how openness and transparency can help. And as a recent letter put it, when it comes to AI safety and security, we need to think about openness as an antidote, not a poison. And finally, inclusivity. Many of you have said it. It's not just about one institution. It's about an ecosystem of activity. Tino Cuella was mentioning this earlier. It's not a conversation for the few, but for the many. So I look forward to the outcomes of the summit and to the conversation continuing in South Korea and in France. Thank you. Now we have Hiroaki. Hiroaki Dano, a city of Sony Group Corporations. Well, uh, this has been a great day. So I would like to thank the uh, UK government and the organizer for making this uh, event possible. I think we have like a lot of discussion about the uh, regulatory framework and the guidelines. And I think those are very important. At the same time, we should face the reality those uh, regulations might breach against the uh, uh, person uh, or organization with the uh, uh, malicious intentions. So we have to have another countermeasure. I think one of the uh, uh, morning sessions, uh, Yang actually raised the issue that we need the powerful AI to be able to have the uh, uh, you know, countermeasure, and I, I echo that. I think we need to have like a very powerful AI research to be able to uh, uh, counter uh, the possible uh, malus of the AI and then also the failure as well. Now, as probably we should uh, take a little bit like a more in the future. I think we're talking about the uh, 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 cyber security and disinformation, biotechnology, the most of the sessions as one of the uh, risk side as well. But if you look at the uh, uh, 10 years, 20 years into the future, we'll see. Go we're going to have like an AI scientist, for example, as one of the uh, you know, high, highly significant, high impact applications. The AI will make a discovery, scientific discovery, highly autonomously, and that will be, that benefit our civilization a lot. At the same time, because it's a powerfulness, I think we have like a new challenge in how to manage that. I think we probably down the road uh, in a future session, we might actually want to talk about like uh, some of the uh, uh, high impact uh, AI uh, development uh, 10, 20 years uh, in, into the horizons. Now, uh, second thing is as we improve the AI and penetrate into the, uh, uh, all the social system, current AI is really depends on the data and the data is heavily unbiased. Uh, you know, bias actually. So, like, it really depends on the uh, English contents on the specific regions in the world. So, the uh, someone who's in Africa or a part of the Asia, when the serious is fun as advantage because the data is not there uh, in the AI system, they can be accessed in AI, but they don't get a decent reactions. Uh, they don't get the full benefit of uh, uh, AI. I think uh, uh, this is a great forum. Uh, to be able to correct that or probably uh, at the initiative to have like a well-balanced data set uh, respecting culture and diversity and so that no one left behind. And the third and finally, probably not least, where did data come from? Data come from the creators. Someone who take a photo, someone compose the music, someone write. So I think like it's very uh, important for us to be uh, protecting the IP and then uh, even uh, help them to be even more creative so that the uh, richness and diversity and the quality of data can be maintained into the future. So I think like, in the future session, uh, it would be good to have like, a more inclusive on the uh, uh, you know, uh, creators, uh, data providers, and some of who generate uh, those contents so that the, our AI can be harmonized and uh, get the more uh, powerful and uh, sustainable uh, into the future. Well, I think those are the, uh, uh, something we should look into, the, uh, hopefully, uh, into the future. And, uh, uh, this has been a really great session, and I hope like, uh, this will, tradition continues uh, in the Korea and the France. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally in this session, Jess. Thank you. Um, nice and some pressure to have the last word. 
I think one thing that's been really clear to me today is that while many of us may disagree on many things, one thing that there's a fair amount of agreement around is that we do need more oversight and accountability of how AI is being developed, particularly at the frontier. Um, and I think today has done a really good job of both showcasing some of the progress that's been made on this in the last year, um, while also, I think, helping to highlight some of the areas that need a lot more work. Um, so I'll just mention a few areas um, that struck me today. Um, the first is it's been really great to see companies publishing safety policies in a bunch more detail than we've seen before on request of, of governments. Um, I think that external scrutiny and um, competition between companies can go a long way in kind of creating a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom. And I think there's a lot more that especially sort of civil society and academia can do to create some of the scrutiny and pressure that's needed to really kind of improve, improve what happens there. And, and by the next summit, it would be really great to see a lot of those policies developed further and in more detail with some of that kind of back and forth scrutiny and some of that competition um, egging companies on to um, beat each other on this. But ultimately, as was clear in the responsible scaling session we had earlier, we do really need a lot of this to start happening and being driven more outside of companies, not to have companies setting their own rule books, but to have external actors starting to both be able to kind of evaluate systems and be able to set the standards. I think the two safety institutes we've now got announced are really exciting in this regard. What I'm most excited about there is is building the expertise and the capacity to do a lot of this scrutiny outside of government. Um, but there's obviously a really long way to go there and really building up that capacity and, and really bringing in the diversity of expertise we need to ensure that we can assess risks um, across all of the themes that were discussed this morning. Um, I think what would be really great by the next summit is, is if sort of those, those safety institutes and perhaps other third parties were in a place where they could start leading the conversation on what responsible and safe behavior looks like a little more than we've seen today. So we're not just asking the companies to develop policies, but, but there's more kind of questions coming, coming to them from government and third sector. And third, I think ultimately all of this needs to be underpinned by regulation. That was pretty clear in a lot of our discussion sessions too. There is a lot of uncertainty about and a lot of challenging questions about regulation. Open source is one. Um, but I think there are some things that we're relatively clear on and most people can agree on about the need for transparency and greater oversight um, that could be regulated and mandated now. I think the US executive order goes a long way to sort of make a start on that and it would be really great to see other companies, other countries, sorry, follow. Um, and by the next summit, it would be really great to see more detailed regulatory proposals being discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for those thought-provoking reflections. Now, to close off the first day of the summit, our last full section is on AI for good, one of the, the key reasons why we're all here and why we are trying to introduce mitigations. And I have the great pleasure of introducing to the stage Minister Husik from Australia, Minister Inga Beer Ray from Rwanda, and Dene, Demis, sorry. <laughs> as Eva. Come on, please, to the stage. Thank you very much. Hopefully, Demis will forgive me for cocking up his last name, but it's been a very long day and a very long few weeks for all of us in the build-up to this summit. But this is going to be uh, somewhat of a bit of a, an organic um, session where I ask a few questions and we talk about AI for good. I think it will be quite difficult probably for our, our panelists to identify specific areas because there is so much good that can come from AI. But when I'm asked this question, I'm particularly passionate about education. And I think the role that AI can play in education is phenomenal because when we think about it, across all of our societies, all of our countries, all of our cultures, education is the real foundation, the real springboard to opportunity. And when we look back on our lives and we think about our time in education, what strikes us is those individual teachers that had the time to invest in us, to inspire us, and to encourage us to go on and manage to be in this room today. And one of the key ways that AI can help is obviously by reducing some of that admin, that bureaucracy, and that paperwork, and freeing up teachers to have more of that face-to-face -face time. And here in the UK, we just announced 
a fund in order to us for in order to for us to move towards that and we have a goal for every single teacher here in the UK to have an AI powered assistant to enable them to be producing lesson plans that are targeted to each individual pupil and to be able to actually unlock some of the bureaucracy and give them more of that face-to-face -face time. But I'm, I'm really interested to hear what our panelists think is uh, their top example of AI for good. Should we start with you, Minister? For sure, thank you. Um, and I think it's important for us to recognise what we are doing right now hasn't happened and doesn't happen often in terms of bringing people together to think around uh, the application of technology uh, in terms of international fora. So it is important for us to do what we're doing right now and to think about those use cases that are very positive. Uh, I can think uh, in the Australian example, there's a, a terrific young woman, an Australian, who I, of all places, met in Boston, who was developing uh, a robot using AI in a paediatric setting to help young kids with their care at, during the time of some of their um, toughest health battles. And she's now gone on and built a company 12 strong in six months uh, around that. Uh, I also think of uh, a bi bionic ear manufacturer uh, that is enhancing their software uh, through the use of AI to deliver the gift of sound to people that have been denied it uh, and being able to use uh, that in that way. Or the uh, AI-powered drones that are delivering life-saving medicines to remote communities in the Pacific. Uh, all uh, in our country are being done uh, by Australian firms that are using technology but wanting to get that balance right. And it's that what, that's what we're trying to think about. What we're trying to think about is those case studies uh, where AI has had that, that effect and uh, to also think, well, if this goes wrong, where is the balance? Uh, and it is a bit of a vexed debate, just picking up on your thing around education finally. Um, yeah, AI holds the promise to deliver personalised education outcomes tailored to people individually, right? But we're also thinking about generative AI in the classroom and we're having the similar debates that we'd had decades earlier where we thought if we introduced calculators to classrooms, people wouldn't be able to perform maths anymore. Um, you know, technology has found a way, people have used technology in a way to help themselves, but it is the role of us, and again, this is the importance of this type of grouping, it's up to us to think around those guardrails, the safer operating environment. Mm. Dennis? Yes, well, look, I think um, there's so many opportunities here and, and um, there's so many challenges also facing, I think, society in the world if you look at environment, climate, disease, uh, and I think AI has the potential to uh, impact and help um, as a tool to help our experts and scientists um, solve some of those biggest problems. So my, my personal passion is actually using AI for scientific discovery and to, and to advance medicine. Um, and I think we're beginning to see the examples of, of what that can do in a transformative way. Um, you know, we've, we've worked on things like AlphaFold that can predict the 3D structure of proteins, and we hope that will accelerate into, into drug discovery, and maybe by an order of magnitude, instead of taking years to discover new drugs, maybe the order of months. Um, I think we're also seeing being applied to material design, uh, new types of energy like plasma containment and fusion, um, and even in fields like mathematics and theorem proving and important conjectures in mathematics. So I think it's kind of almost endless where I can see AI improving um, our knowledge. And, you know, maybe you can even think of in the next 10 years almost a new like, renaissance, a new golden era of scientific discovery with these very powerful um, uh, tools helping our, our top scientists make progress. Um, and then, you know, of course, talking about education, I agree with the minister, there's incredible potential for personalised education. Really happy to hear the, the announcement of the, of the fund. I think it's an incredible opportunity there for AI to improve education. And also, commercially, I think there's enormous opportunities for the next generation to start new businesses and startups uh, that apply AI to improve all sorts of um, parts of our lives for billions of people around the world with new AI-powered products and services. And I think there, we need to make sure there's access to all around the world to the new students to gain, um, uh, gain the technology skills they need to utilize AI uh, to the fullest extent. And we've tried to do our bit in that. We've, we're founding sponsors of the Deep in Darba uh, uh, meeting, which has become the preeminent machine learning conference in Africa. And we sponsor hundreds of students at master's levels to, from underrepresented backgrounds to get 
uh, master's uh, degrees in AI. And I think they can then go on to take advantage uh, of this and improve their own lives and, and others around in their communities. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Mister? Yep, so I also agree. I think when you look at healthcare and education, there's uh, massive opportunities. What we've done for Rwanda when we launched our national AI policy was to back it with an economic impact assessment on where do we see uh, the biggest potential um, of deploying AI solutions. And so what we saw uh, were about four areas that ranked high. Agriculture was one of them. That was also because predominantly uh, we are an agriculture-based uh, uh, economy. And so we're trying to think about how uh, to deploy AI solutions in a manner that is inclusive and creates value um, uh, for everyone within the country, agriculture ranked highest. The second one was public services, and this was really looking at how do you use AI solutions to improve uh, public service delivery, um, uh, but also looking at things like better tax revenue collection, better healthcare insurance claims management. Um, when it came to public transportation, looking at how do you deploy AI models to support um, you know, bus scheduling and ensuring that you have a more reliable and efficient uh, public transport system. Uh, but the one that I want to you know, emphasize most is around healthcare. And so what we've been doing, um, in many ways, of course, we look at the opportunities around early disease detection, um, you know, drug discovery, and all these benefits. But what we've done for Rwanda, because we have community health workers being uh, the very front-facing um, uh, uh, health workers for the people and supporting with, um, you know, providing health services to people within different communities, particularly in rural areas, what we've done is to create um, AI models where we're leveraging large language models that provide decision support um, um, uh, uh, solutions to the community health workers. Uh, case in point is like malaria, and so even just looking at how do you help with malaria detection, a combination of both uh, clinical data and environmental data uh, to support with monitoring and detection of uh, the malaria outbreak. Why is this very important for us? Uh, beyond the fact that we've already been able to estimate about $589 million potential, which is equivalent to 6% of our GDP, it's also the fact that as Rwanda, we have positioned ourselves as a proof of concept hub for some of these emerging technologies. And so if we're able to use AI to solve for a problem in healthcare, then it's much more easier to replicate a similar solution in different parts of the continent because the challenges we face are almost um, uh, similar in nature. And so this is where we see the most potential, and of course not neglecting um, environment monitoring and really figuring out um, how we do all of that. I wanted to conclude with the fact that when you look at our AI, our national AI policy, beyond the building blocks of data strategy, the required in compute infrastructure that is needed, the talents and capabilities required, what we've done is to, in order to manage risk, because this whole day we'll be talking about risk, we want government to be at the forefront of deploying these AI solutions because then we can understand better the risks that come with deploying these solutions and then we're in a better position to put in place the right guardrails and regulations uh, before we take a backseat to only do regulation and the private sector deploys solutions. And so we are, over the next five years, we're going to be, as a government, looking at what are the different opportunities within the different industries where we can deploy AI solutions and use that as a way uh, to inform the policies and regulations and standards that we put in place working with the private sector. Thank you. And when it comes to um, making sure that we can truly seize the opportunities in relation to AI for good, that doesn't also... It doesn't always mean domestically, of course, because obviously AI has the potential to help us solve global challenges like climate change. And I was interested to know uh, your reflections, each of you, on how can we work better globally to truly seize the opportunities, which needs to be at the heart of, of this summit and this discussion, not only how we can grip the risks. Hmm. Uh, again, uh, I think what we've seen here uh, today is uh, countries large and small recognising in a way that has not happened previously uh, that we do need to be able to work together and find common pathways, realising uh, it's effectively harmonise where we can and act locally where we have to, but uh, given the way in which, as you indicated uh, a few moments ago, the reach of the technology, the way that it's being developed in different parts of the world, applied elsewhere, um, these type of... Uh, uh, gatherings as well as what will happen in uh, Korea and in France uh, and keeping that momentum going and I pick up I think on Martin's point of not losing 
uh, the moment uh, as well and keeping the momentum uh, going uh, will be very important. And I think we're all driven, finally, uh, by as much as we're talking about risk, uh, is through all this being able to really get the maximum benefit for differing communities with differing challenges but who want to do well out of the application of the technology. Yeah, thank you. Demis. Yeah, well, I think uh, AI is such a um, global technology. And mm. It's going to affect everyone in the world. And it's, it's amazing to see the international group gathered here. And I think it's going to need, ideally, global standards uh, that we can all kind of converge on for the benefit of everyone. Um, so I think that's important. And perhaps this is one of the first steps towards that. And I look forward to that continuing in the, in the, in the subsequent summits. Um, just also back, going back to the scientific point, I think there's a lot of potential between collaboration between companies uh, and academia in terms of applying AI to domains, specialized domains, whether that's biology or chemistry or climate, where there are experts in that domain, uh, maybe, and, and mostly they're usually in academia, and then going to them to understand really what the questions are, the, the actual critical questions that are vital for that subject, and then how to map AI onto that. Uh, and, and that's what we've been very successful doing, actually, at DeepMind, is to collaborate with those domain experts in a really multidisciplinary way. And that's the only way that you can actually apply AI in the right way. Um, because often, uh, you know, AI can seem this sort of magical tool, but in fact, you need to use it in the right way, and it's only suitable for certain things. Uh, and you really need to understand that other domain, and you only get that through collaboration. Very true. Thank you. Yes. So I believe in addition to the standards and regulations that the, I would make three points. One is around creating the kind of partnerships that will democratize access uh, to compute infrastructure um, um, across the board. Um, I think we know that computing infrastructure is really um, concentrated in certain parts of the world. And so if we're talking about inclusion, how do we ensure that we are democratizing access uh, to such capacity and capabilities? The second one is building partnerships that allow for creating the right talent across the board. Because with talent comes uh, the need to build solutions that are contextualized to certain challenges. Uh, the absence of ensuring that we have um, you know, talent across the board will, will mean that many developing countries will remain consumers for a long time, if not uh, playing catch up for a very long time. So how building the right capabilities, building the right talent that will fuel these AI-enabled innovations is very critical. And the last one is around AI research. Um, again, um, there's never going to be a one-size-fits-all model of how we deploy AI. It's always going to be uh, specific to everyone's context, what kind of challenges you're trying to solve for, whether or not AI is the best uh, you know, use case for how you want to solve those challenges. And so understanding uh, the intersection between research and product development and how we enable that uh, to drive impactful, responsible deployment of AI is going to be critical, and that should be at the heart of all these uh, global partnerships that we are engaging in. Thank you. Uh, everybody give a round of applause for our panel. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was really important to share a range of different areas that AI can make a transformational difference. Now, before we close day one, we're nearly there, guys. We're nearly there. We must reflect uh, that we have spoken about the importance of ensuring that we build on the conversations that have taken place today and create that long-lasting legacy for the future summits of AI. This is a historical gathering. Many people have said that throughout the day. And building on that Bletchley Declaration is only really the beginning of the conversation. So with that in mind, in the host next year's AI Summit, we have, of course, the Republic of Korea and then also France. And I would like to once again thank them for taking on that baton. Thank you. So I would like to thank Minister Lee Jong-ho and Minister Barrow for their willingness to take on the discussions and I will give them some top tips after this. But I would like to welcome Minister Lee Jong-ho to the stage to say a few short words. Thank you. Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my great, uh, my great honor to have this opportunity to close the session. The emergence of generative AI has 
electrified the whole world. Uh, and now, countries around the world are recognizing that this wondrous new technology can bring both benefits and the risks at the same time. Due to the concerns that fast-paced AI race can result in potential risks proportional to AI's benefits, uh, some even called for a pause on advanced AI development for six months. As you can see, technology is a double-edged sword that can enhance our lives, but at the same time put us in a great danger. That is why the safe use of technology is highly important. In particular, a technology like AI is known for its immediate and connected nature. So our approach to promoting the safe use of AI should be handled on a global level, not by a certain country or a company. The international community should also work together to narrow the digital gap and increase digital literacy so that the benefits of AI leave no one behind. In this regard, at the uh, Digital Vision Forum held in Paris in June, President Yoon suk Yeol uh, suggested creating an international organization under the UN for discussing digital norms for uh, emerging technologies, including AI. In September, Korea published a digital bill of rights which proposes freedom, uh, fairness, safety, innovation, and uh, solidarity as five principles that can guide the direction of AI governance uh, in the age of, age of deepening digitalization. I believe today's summit held in Rectory Park served as a good opportunity to reflect these suggestions by Korea and uh, concretize them. The Republic of Korea and the United Kingdom have agreed to co-host the next AI Safety Summit six months later in order to make meaningful contributions to advancing global discussions on the safe use of AI. I hope that the next summit will provide a venue for evaluating the AI safety testing system discussed today and identifying common rules that will be supported by both government and the major private companies. Today, we are gathered here to witness a historic moment where we are explore how to work together and how to promote AI safety. Before I finish, I would like to thank the UK government once again for hosting the AI Safety Summit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can pick. Uh, right, thank, um, you. No. <laughs> thank you. And today truly has been a historic summit. I believe we have begun building a lasting international consensus on the safe development of artificial intelligence. And we shouldn't underestimate the significance of the work that we've done over the last few weeks getting here, but also in the last few hours too. And I am once again grateful to all of the chairs of today's session and for sharing their insights. What we have done today is assembled for the first time a truly inspirational cohort of policymakers, of developers, and civil society representatives focused exclusively on the frontier. Through the Bletchley Declaration, we have laid the foundations for addressing one of the greatest challenges of our generation, the emerging risks of frontier AI. And as we stand here or sit here today, we should once again consider that science fiction is quickly becoming science fact. And when it comes to the frontier, AI is increasingly unconstrained by our borders. It is not just that an international approach to this issue is preferable, it is absolutely essential. And as I said this morning, 
we are all in agreement that we need to move away from the speculation and the hypotheticals and move towards the scientific and the empirical. And I think that we would all agree that today we've had many productive conversations that have begun to do just this. Leaders and thinkers from across the spectrum of cultures and ideals have been able to contribute and help shape the future. Yet despite our varying perspectives, we have managed to reach a level of agreement that would not have been realized without convening today. As the eyes of the world are truly upon us, we can send them a message that we stand ready. We stand ready to harness one of the most important technologies in human history. The ink is still wet on this new and important chapter in the story of how safe AI can become a transformational force for good across the world. And many of us have indeed been surprised by the speed at which AI has been advancing. However, our collective efforts today have shown that humanity can move even faster, heading towards advanced mitigations and processes like responsible capability scaling. But we cannot take this for granted. The sense of urgency that has brought us here together will naturally begin to dissipate when we return to our respective countries and organizations. But the sense of cohesion and unity that we have developed here at Bletchley must remain at the forefront of our minds. And we must also recognize that governments do not have all the answers. Quite simply, none of us can do this alone. Because I truly believe that we are at a crossroads in human history. And to turn the wrong way would be a monumental missed opportunity for mankind. We will each have to make a concerted effort to maintain momentum and ensure the outcomes of this summit drive forward new action. As a new science and new research becomes available to help us guide us in the right direction, we must remain agile and alert. And also, we must begin to consider the importance of working together at every step. And by the time that we reconvene at our checkpoint in six months' time hosted by the Republic of Korea and the next summit in a year's time at France, we will have those new models many, many times more powerful than we have today. But because of the work that we have undertaken here at Bletchley, these unprecedented advances will be measure, mirrored by an unprecedented mobilization on safety. Our contribution starts with the UK AI Safety Institute, driving forward research and improving our understanding of the risks before they emerge. The Bletchley Declaration will, for the first time, hold us equally accountable and solidify that united stance. And the many international agreements and accords that have come before this summit will be strengthened by that unity. Where we entered this summit with diverse and conflicting scientific views, we should aim to enter the next summit with progress towards a scientific consensus on the risks we face, grounded in empirical evidence. This is perhaps the greatest advance we will ever see in human history. And we are not just witnesses to it, but we are the authors of it. This confers immense responsibility to the rest of humanity and to future generations to get this right. And so our work isn't done today. It is just getting started. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. The reception will be starting shortly in the Clark Pavilion. If you have any belongings in the Hub Cloakroom, please remember to collect these prior to the reception. Thank you.